Anyasio and welcome ninth graders. Today it's Wednesday for you, but today it's Tuesday for me. Uh, it's Tuesday night, probably around 11 o'clock. I'm still doing videos for science class tomorrow. <laughs> My life sucks. <laughs> Anyways, uh, even though things are tough, I'm still uh, trying to take part in Virtual Spirit Week, so I'm rocking a necklace. I've got my lotus flower necklace to represent, uh, you know, my Buddhist, uh, my Buddhist religious background. Um, shout out to my other Buddhists in ninth grade. If you're not Buddhist, you don't have to feel left out. Like, you, cool. I'm cool with you too, so don't worry. <laughs> but anyways, uh, Spirit Week. Hopefully, it's making distance learning less miserable. Let's go ahead and jump into our uh, title. Title of today's uh, presentation is Weather and Climate Five. Uh, you, if you're thinking critically or if you remember anything from yesterday's lesson, uh, yesterday was weather and climate three, so we skipped one. Uh, yesterday's lesson was a little bit shorter than I wanted it to be. Um, I don't want to keep you in front of the computer for too long, but at the same time, um, it just it wasn't one of those lessons that I felt like really proud about. Um, so lesson four was going to be a short lesson about ocean breeze, sea breeze, and maybe not the most sort of engaging material. Lesson five, however, you know, I feel really good about. So let's let's dig into something a little bit more interesting today. And today we're going to talk about the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt. Um, so to begin, our objectives, our content objective, it's pretty intimidating. I want you to be able to understand the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, and the effects of microplastics. And so your language objective is going to be just as daunting. I want you to be able to explain how garbage accumulates in gyres, which is a key word which we'll talk about later, and how it works its way into humans. So just take a minute to think about content and language objectives. And as we're going through this lesson, just go ahead and pause from time to time. Go back to your content and language objectives so you can just stay focused on what we're doing today. So keywords, we've got a few of them. Our first keyword is salinity. Salinity is the salt content in a liquid. Uh, usually when we talk about oceans, we're talking about salinity. Uh, when we talk about water, we talk about salinity. There's also saline solution for those of you who use contact lenses. Saline solution has a little salt in it, um, so it kind of mimics tears. Uh, our next word is redistribute. And redistribute is when you divide something up and you distribute it in a different way. Our next word is gyre. Gyre is an area of the ocean where um, it's kind of like the doldrums in a sense that there's no strong current. Um, however, there is there is a bit of a current. There's kind of a very slow spin that happens at a gyre. Uh, our next keyword is microplastic. Microplastic is um, what happens to plastics. Plastics actually never go away, they never break down, um, but they can form smaller and smaller pieces, but they'll never break down in the sense that they'll never stop being these plastic molecules. Um, so for example, we have um, organic molecules like our bodies. Our bodies will break down, right? They'll, they're not going to break down into smaller and smaller bits of sajin. Well, I'm not going to break down into smaller and smaller bits of sajin as I die. Like eventually I'm just going to become like dirt, right? I'm going to change chemically. Um, microplastics, they, they stay forever. Uh, photodegrade. Photodegrade is how uh, plastic um, kind of breaks into smaller and smaller pieces. Uh, photo is for sun and degrade means to um, break up. So sunlight exposure to sunlight will break up plastics into smaller and smaller. So our lesson begins in Hong Kong. Now I want you to imagine a giant freight ship. And when I say giant, I mean it carries gigantic uh, cargo boxes, I guess you could call them. Box isn't really the right word because one of these freight boxes fits on the back of a semi-truck. Like you'll see semi-trucks pulling these freight boxes, probably with the title Yang on it. Anyways, um, these cargo ships are loaded up with hundreds of these boxes and they're gigantic. They're huge, they travel very slowly, they go across the ocean and this uh, freighter is traveling from Hong Kong to the United States in 1992. And one of the things that it's carrying is rubber duckies. 
I'm talking about the little yellow rubber duckies that go in a bathtub. Maybe if you've got younger siblings, they have something like this, a toy like this. Anyways, this freighter is traveling across the ocean and something terrible happens. It sinks. It sinks and it sends 28,000 rubber duckies into the ocean. So rubber duckies spill into the ocean and rubber duckies start appearing in all parts of the world shortly thereafter. Now, I, I shouldn't say shortly thereafter. They start appearing all over the world um, years and years and years after and they keep appearing in different parts of the world afterwards. And so the journey of these rubber duckies is helping scientists understand how ocean currents work. So uh, not only does air move due to convection, not only does the Earth's mantle move due, due to convection, water also moves due to convection. Um, it moves due to heat, but there are other forces that water tries to balance out or achieve equilibrium with, which cause this sort of motion that also happens in the ocean. So we have heat, but we also have density. Right? So if, uh, in areas where water is more dense and less dense, there will be a convection where it tries to kind of mix and circulate and reach an equilibrium. Uh, this also goes for salinity. salinity. So we have very salty water, not so salty water. At some point, they're going to try and mix so they reach a state of equilibrium. In addition, uh, movement of ocean water is also affected by two other things, one being the wind and the other being the tides. So all five of these things kind of combine together to give us the great ocean conveyor belt. Okay, so as I mentioned before, all five of those things, they combine and they give us um, these currents which travel through the ocean. They're kind of like paths or roads in which the water travels through the ocean. And this path um, really lets the water recirculate. And here, um, we have the rubber duckies. They are also traveling on this path on this great ocean conveyor belt and they are appearing in all of these places at different times. So it looked like um, this freighter from Hong Kong crashed or went underwater north of Hawaii and then um, this was in 1992. And so it wasn't until well actually very early in November of 1992 we found rubber duckies near Alaska and then we f started finding them. This is the Kamchatka Peninsula in uh, Siberia. And then we found them in Tacoma, Washington. And then later on in the UK, and as late as 2007, they started washing up in Europe. And so this is another picture of our rubber duckies as they traveled across the world. So this gave us a lot of information about the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt. So the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt, it redistributes heat all over the world. And not only does it affect weather, but it affects climate. And this is something we're going to talk about a little bit more later. But weather is kind of the day-to-day -day things that happen. But climate is kind of like what your weather is like over the course of a year. So for example, Minnesota has what we call a temperate climate. So it has four seasons, it has winters with snow, it has springs, uh, hot summers, like really hot summers, sometimes very humid summers, and then fall where like deciduous trees, uh, their leaves change colors. So that's the climate of Minnesota. And the weather can change day to day. And, and some of you, you know, discovered that like, hey, in Minnesota, we can have snow in April. Um, and that's weather, that's weird weather, but it doesn't mean Minnesota is no longer a temperate climate. Uh, however, when we talk about, we'll just say Thailand uh, or Somalia, um, the climate there is very different, right? So if you had snow there, then that would be freak weather. If it became a temperate zone where there was a winter, where there was like months and months of snow, then that would be climate. And so change of weather happens sometimes, but change of climate happens much more slowly. Um, so um, the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt, it affects not only weather, but it affects climate. And we'll talk a little bit more about this when we um, take a look at a picture of the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt. So. These days, our oceans are getting warmer due to global warming, and so this ocean conveyor belt is slowing down significantly.
and this is going to have large effects on the Earth's climate. So here we have a picture of the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt. We can see we've got cold water and warm water moving along different pathways in the world. And if you can look at this, um, I guess, path of warm water, you can see it travels up Africa and right next to Europe. Okay, and because if we look at Europe, Europe is actually located very far north. Uh, if we look at the same uh, latitude in North America, we'll notice that um, very cold places like, I don't know, uh, Canada, all of Canada, are pretty much on the same latitude as places like Italy or Greece, which are actually pretty warm places in Europe. And so why are there these very different temperatures in Canada compared to Europe? Well, it's this great ocean conveyor belt. The warm water from the Atlantic Ocean travels up towards Europe and it brings warmer weather. It makes the climate much warmer than it does when it cools down with and mixes with the, the water in the Arctic and then drops, moves back down towards North America. And so the movement of this water creates what we call gyres. Gyres are kind of areas where water gets funneled uh, and then kind of slows down and, and almost comes to a stop. And so um, the conveyor belt also causes gyres and these gyres have resulted in what we call the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, I wanted to have, a, I don't know, there's so many different images you can have of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, but basically in the ocean, off the coast, in between basically Hawaii and San Francisco is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It's a gigantic, and by gigantic, I mean twice the size of Texas, pile of garbage in the ocean. So our ocean conveyor belt sort of brings plastics that are floating in the ocean to this area, and then the current kind of slows down, and these plastics accumulate in this area. Also, the conveyor belt, the way it works in this area is it kind of works in a circle. And, which is the reason why we use the word gyre from, I guess it's the Greek root gyro for like gyroscope. Anyways, uh, this gyre ends up collecting lots and lots of plastic debris. Most of it is fishing nets, um, but a lot of it is like discarded bags and packing foam. Um, nonetheless, all of this plastic is uh, photodegrading in the ocean it's turning into what we call microplastic and this microplastic is going everywhere. This is another image of <clears throat> garbage in the ocean. I don't think it's the Great Pacific Garbage Patch though because I can see a little bit of land in the background and I think once um, you get out to the Great Pacific Garbage Patch you can't really even see land because it's so far away. So let's talk about microplastics. As mentioned before, microplastics never go away. They can break down into smaller and smaller pieces, but they're still plastic. The way plastics, microplastics break down in the way plastics break down into microplastics is through sunlight. Sunlight causes them to photodegrade. They break down into smaller and smaller pieces. Now microplastics have worked their way into everything. They're everywhere. They found microplastics on mountaintops, like cold mountaintops where all there is is, is snow. You know, nope, it's not like people have left pollution there. It's just microplastics are small enough to get in the atmosphere. They blow around. Um, they're on mountaintops, deep sea trenches, deep, deep, deep under the ocean. They found microplastics. They've discovered um, new forms of life that they'd never seen before. Uh, and inside these new forms of life, they found microplastics, right? Microplastics have found uh, all sorts of new and rare forms of life before uh, humans discovered them. Um, even in our underground aquifers, so I'm talking about things like well, wells. People dig underground to get water, they dig a well, and inside of that well water is microplastics. Somehow microplastics are working their way through the ground into our freshwater systems. So uh, microplastics themselves, the science is not really clear on how bad they are for us and how they're going to hurt us. Um, I think it's 
generally assumed that this is a very plastics are a very unnatural thing and so um, ingesting them and having them build up in our bodies is not going to be healthy but in addition to those problems um, other pollutants have a tendency to build up on microplastics so things like PCBs PHHs and heavy metals like lead will build up on microplastics PCB and PHHs, uh, PAHs, I'm not sure what the acronyms are for exactly, but these things are generally, sorry, I got an itchy nose. I know I shouldn't be touching my face with coronavirus. Anyways, uh, PCBs, PAHs are uh, industrial chemicals. Um, they're pollutants and they cause a lot of damage to the human body. This is an image of microplastics and these little microplastic pieces are not as small as they can get. They found microplastics inside of bacteria, right? So they can get much smaller than we can see. This is an image of PCBs going into the food system, but PCBs and microplastics could be entering the food system the same way, right? So we have the very lowest part of our um, food chain uh, which would be like phytoplankton and those phytoplankton get eaten by other small creatures we'll just say like shrimp so let's look at number three and let's start with phytoplankton so phytoplankton maybe they have one particle of microplastic inside of them a shrimp eats three phytoplankton per day right so that's three pieces of microplastic inside that shrimp and we'll just say in a week it eats, well, you know, a week is seven days. So that's 21, right? So it's got 21 pieces of uh, microplastics inside its body. And then a herring eats that shrimp, okay? And herrings are probably going to eat more than one shrimp per day, right? They're probably going to eat, I don't know, even if we just say seven, right? So then we've got 21 times seven inside of that herring. And then herring get eaten by salmon. Right, and a salmon's probably gonna eat more than one herring a day. Maybe we eat three salmon. So we've got um, 21 times seven times three, and maybe you know over the course of the week that's times seven again. So I mean, you can just see that like the number of microplastics inside of living organisms is just going to reproduce—not reproduce, but it, expand exponentially. It's going to grow exponentially. And so um, the last picture is a large mammal like an orca eating a salmon and they probably eat lots of salmon and other mammals that eat salmon are human beings. So we also eat salmon as well. And so you can just see how these uh, microplastics can accumulate in our body. So one of the effects of my, or some of the effects of microplastics are um, damage to the liver. Liver kind of like takes poison out of your body. People who drink too much um, end up with damaged livers, and so uh, microplastics can potentially damage the liver. They have potential effects on fertility, your ability to make babies. Um, it also can infect your endocrine system, which is like your hormones. Uh, and finally. <clears throat> Uh, microplastics can affect both growth and the brain. So lots of very negative uh, potential effects from microplastics, but we're still studying what they do to the body because microplastics are a very new thing uh, in our environment. So let's talk about homework. I know it's been a long lesson. My apologies, because like I said, I was trying to shorten lessons. Hopefully it doesn't feel so bad because you had a shorter lesson next to a longer lesson. Anyways, homework. Write a story uh, tracing the journey of a plastic bag from a store into the ocean and ultimately into the body of a human being. And I'd like you to try and use as many science ideas as you can into your story. And like this doesn't have to be the next great novel, you know, just, just make a simple story. Uh, it'll probably be like a page. And I'll give you until next Friday to do this. Um, if this is too hard, then let me know and we'll, we'll figure something out. Uh, you can contact me at sjkwok at sejongacademy.org. You can also contact Mr. O at hoh1 at sejongacademy.org. And finally, you can always hit me up during office hours every day, 9.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. Okay, have a great day. Peace.